About a year ago, I said the M3 MacBook Air was like the MacBook Pro Mini. And that's because I tested it with software developer tasks for a whole week and it did pretty well. Well, guess what? This year, not only do we have the new processor in there, but it also goes up to 32 gigs of memory. I've been using this for a little while now, for a few weeks. The 16 gigabyte version is great. The 32 gigabyte version is even better for professional software developer use cases. Under $1,000 for the 16 gigabyte one and $1,599 for the 32 two gigabyte version. Ah. Oh. Should you choose to spend that extra money on the 32 gig version? Well, I hope to answer that question today and I'm gonna throw a bunch of software developer tasks at it and we'll see where the 16 gigabyte version starts to buckle. I'm gonna do some CPU related stuff. I'm gonna do some memory related stuff, Docker, virtual machines here. I got Windows on there. I got Linux on there. And I kind of want to simulate a realistic workflow. Maybe not realistic for everybody, but I'm gonna load up the systems a little bit because we're not just gonna have one program open as software developers, we're going to be using our machines. I've got Windows running as a virtual machine using Parallels. By the way, I have several videos on how to do that. I'll link to some of them down below. Windows is allocated eight gigabytes of memory and four cores of the CPU. So this Windows is no slouch. Even though it's a virtual machine, it's very capable. Look how fast that browser comes up. Then I've got Ubuntu running here. And by the way, these are brand new installations of these. And that's because while I do use a Windows virtual environment on my daily drive, driver, which is the M4 Max MacBook Pro, that Windows instance is about 130 gigabytes by itself. And that's the one downside to both of these is while they have enough memory now, there's just not enough space. After doing all my installations of all the software, and it's not that much, by the way, I have 26 gigabytes left on the base model MacBook Air, and that's just not enough. Now the ports on these are Thunderbolt 4 now, which means that you can actually hook up a pretty fast drive to it and do file transfers. And it's very fast. I've done some tests on the channel. This MacBook Air comes with 512. So we've got a lot more room and that's the minimum that I recommend using. Let's pop open uh, Firefox inside Ubuntu and see what happens here. Okay. Thanks helicopter. Somebody must have written a comment. More helicopter in your videos, please. Well, there you go. Wow, I forgot that uh, Firefox started asking all these questions now at the beginning. Thanks, Firefox. You might start to notice a little bit of a difference here. It's uh, quite usable, but the programs open up just a little bit faster on this machine on the right, in a virtual machine. So <laughs> it's still crazy to think that everything works so well inside a virtual machine. Let's take a look at the memory usage here. Even though I have Windows running, even though I have Notion running and Todoist and Terminal open, as well as the host machine's Chrome browser with a bunch of what is that like 15 tabs and I'm watching a video inside of a virtual machine we're just now starting to get a little bit into the orange here on the left on the 16 gigabyte machine we're up to 13 gigabytes used here we've got 23 gigabytes used but memory pressure is fine and we're doing quite well over here now the swap memory is about the same on both of them about a gig still very snappy now I'm gonna continue this and let's pop open VS code in fact I'm going to do this from the terminal because it's just easier to see the difference. And let's go. Boom. Oh, what? The machine on the left popped this open faster. How did that happen? Let's try that again. Now, VS Code is already open and cached, but let's just see. Okay, the machine on the right opened that faster. That's what I would expect. It's a very small difference. One more time. Okay, about the same. It's negligible, right? Let's completely close out VS Code, open it one more time. And yeah, they're about the same. And just going through these files one by one, opening them up real quick, I don't notice any lag on either one of these. We are showing orange memory pressure on the machine on the left. And I've actually demonstrated this with an eight gigabyte machine a couple of times, showing how good memory management is with Mac OS. Whatever is in the background is doing a good job keeping that at bay, not interfering with the stuff that you need immediately. Let's keep going. I'm gonna pop open Xcode and we'll see how long that takes. All right. Obviously, it opened up much faster over there than on the left. Let's create a new project here and you can see as I go how long things take. Okay, project ready to go on the right. A little bit of a lag on the left, but we got a lot of stuff going on right now at this point. Still, is the left unusable? Not really, but are you going to be way more comfortable and faster with the machine on the right? 
There you go. You got your answer. And if that's all you wanted to know, this 32 gigabyte machine is going to be faster at things, have more room for you to move around quicker. But what about executing things? Well, let's run this Xcode project that I just created. Xcode is highly optimized for Mac OS. So this is going to run pretty well on both machines, even though it is going to run a little bit faster on the machine on the right with more memory there. But what about Android Studio? And for those people that are developing cross-platform applications or strictly Android applications, we'll take a look at that momentarily. Usually that's a big culprit and I might have to quit a few programs. Hey, wow, the app started on iOS simulator on the left faster than on the right. Maybe that's just because it got stuck. No, nope, it's still going. What's going on with that one? There it is. It's opening up. That took a while. Something's got to be off on that one. They're the exact same version of Xcode, the exact same version of iOS and the same version of the simulator. Odd things always happen. You never know. Let's try that again one more time and boom. Build succeeded, sim open on both of them, and it's starting up, and the app started on the right first. This is kind of what I would expect under normal circumstances here. So the one on the right is a little bit better. Let's check out the memory now. Oh, we got a little bit of memory pressure going on when it was not opening over there. And you saw the result of what happens when you have high memory pressure. The simulator was just uh, stuck a little bit and then the memory pressure got free and now it's okay. Here we're constantly in the orange now, severely digging more into that swap. Check it out, 4.69 gigabytes in the swap now, here under one gig still. All right, we'll come back to heavy taxing tasks. Oh, that's hard to say. Heavy taxing tasks. But I'm going to turn some of this stuff off right now. Get back to basics to see how things actually work on these machines when you're not being a total pain in its neck like I am being right now. Tech hiring is ruthless right now. Openings are scarce and layoffs keep making the news. You get one interview, you miss it, and it could be months before your next. This is Formation, the world's first AI-powered personal trainer for your engineering career. Built by two former meta engineers, Formation's patented algorithm pinpoints your gaps and quickly designs a custom roadmap to close them. Think ultimate personalized coding drills, tiny group mentorship, and one-on-one -on -one mock interviews. This is for data structures, system design, behavioral interviews, preparing engineers for up to 14 types of technical interviews you may encounter. As soon as Meta, Google, Nvidia, or other FANG opportunities appear, Formation flips your prep to company-specific patterns so that you walk in ready. It works. Meta is their top landing spot and grads average a 110,000 bump in pay. Don't gamble with your next offer. Train with Formation. Hit the link in the description and level up today. This is a very taxing setup right now. This would be a MacBook Pro equivalent. I'm going to shut down Linux and I'm going to shut down Windows. So I've lightened the load a bit just to get both of these machines back under that comfortable memory pressure. Swap used is under a gigabyte on both of them. Memory used is... 9.24 over here, 6.37 over here. So we're we're okay. I'm gonna pop open this uh, C++ sorting algorithm test that I have going on here. And I have this um, quick sort that's actually a single core operation. And we're sorting 10 million integers. That's a single core one. And here is a multi-core equivalent. And this one is the merge sort, different algorithm. But this one has a lot more numbers to sort, about 100 million, I believe. No, a billion. Wow, but it should be a lot faster. Now I would expect, because these two have the exact same chip in it, the M4 chip, I would expect that using a single core operation like that would be the same on both of these. So let's time that and boom. I'm gonna see how quick they each process this. This is 10 million integers, so we should not be digging too much into the memory and therefore not affecting the test that much because all we're trying to see is the same number. If this was a real experiment, this would be called the constant, I guess. I'm not a scientist, you tell me. Tell me in the comments what you what this would be called. We're setting a baseline basically, right? Here you can see that we're using 99% of the CPU, which means one core is being used. If we take a look at the CPU history there, we should be able to see one core being used. Sometimes it jumps around between the cores, but generally it's one core. Both of these machines have 10 cores, the exact same number of cores, because the M4s have 10 cores. Um, I did not mean to make that rhyme, of course. Wait a minute, what's happening? I swear, that's the last dad joke I'm making in this video.
maybe there's going to be a couple more. I don't know. But look how elegantly that task jumped around between core eight and core nine. And what I think happens here is the task gets handed off to one core. It works on it. And then uh, Mac OS sees, oh, that core is getting a little bit too warm. So let's uh, hand it off to this core, which is doing nothing. So then core nine starts working. And if it gets too warm, oh, uh, this core is getting too warm. Let's hand it off to core 10. And you see that's exactly what's happening right there. Okay, they're both done. And almost at the exact same time they finished. Two minutes and 34 seconds on this machine and two minutes, 33 seconds on this machine. That's way too close to call that this machine won. It's within the margin of error. Now let's do the other one, the multi-core sort and boom. Now here we're sorting 1 billion integers. How much uh, memory does 1 billion integers take up? I should know this. An integer typically takes up four bytes, 32 bits, which is four gigabytes of memory. There we go. Now, if it was a 64 bit integers, it would be eight bytes each and that would be eight gigabytes. This probably should not dig into the memory too much on either one of these machines. So it should be just processor intensive task. And you can see that because all the cores are processing this task quite heavily. You can see that from the history chart, but let's peek at that memory anyway, just to make sure. And yeah, we're good. We're good with the memory. We're still under a thousand megabytes in swap on both of these machines. And this task has taken up about five to six gigabytes total. This means that sorting 1 billion integers is a kind of task that should be able to be done at the same time on both of these machines. But if I had other programs open and running, then things might not be so even. And even though that's the case, this one still did it a few seconds faster, two minutes, 25 seconds on the 32 gig machine, two minutes, 29 seconds on the 16 gig machine. We are showing a little bit of a slowdown here, but not terrible. So let's run an even bigger project here. We're going to run a .NET project, which is a full compilation. It's going to be using all the cores. And just to show it to you, we're generating 100,000 namespaces and classes inside those namespaces. And I make sure that the compiler is not going to optimize uh, these away because I have a bunch of actual code in there that's, that should not be optimizable by the compiler. So we're kind of being sneaky here in order to force it to actually do the compilation and build everything. So let's do that .NET build and let's go boom oh yeah nothing was generated so obviously that finished in one second I need to run my Python runner that first generates all the namespaces all right there we go let's go and we'll definitely see quite a bit of work going on here that CPU load is being pushed into the red so that was a pretty heavy little task that was going on but let's see what the memory is like. The memory is doing okay here, but now when the compilation is happening, now it's moving a lot of those little files around. We're definitely seeing a lot more usage of that memory. You can see the memory pressure is going up just a bit and forcing the operating system to do a lot more compression of the memory to make space for what's happening right now in the foreground, for what's being demanded of it. If you take a look at the 32 gigabyte machine, then you'll see the compressed memory is not nearly as high. Oh. We're now hitting orange in the memory pressure on the 16 gigabyte machine. Now we've done it. Now we've done it. And you can see that the large project actually succeeded now at this point on the 32 gigabyte machine, but it's still running on the 16 gigabyte machine. Not finished yet, but almost there. Build succeeded in 68 seconds on the 32 gig machine, 94 seconds on a 16 gig machine. That is a significant difference right there. So this was not related to the performance of the CPU at all. This is a purely memory bound difference. How big a project are you gonna be compiling? Are you gonna be okay with the 16 gigabyte machine? And the answer is yes, you will be okay. Are you gonna be better with a 32 gigabyte machine? The answer is yes, <laughs> you will be a little bit better. What's my personal recommendation? Spend the extra few hundred bucks. I always say get more memory. Get more memory, as much memory as you possibly can afford. You will not regret it. For those of you doing Android Studio, let's pop that open. Android Studio opened up about the same speed on both of these. Let's open up a new project, empty activity, next, and finish. Okay, now it's doing its thing, it's downloading stuff, and finish. At this point, there's some Gradle stuff going on. You know, the uh, the famous Android Studio Gradle builds that happen in the background that are just so fun 
to watch. I don't know, I can't do any work while that's happening. It makes me nervous. Why are they running there in the background? They think I'm gonna start coding while that's running? No, I'm watching this number go up and I'm, I want it to finish before I do anything. I guess it makes them feel better that they put that process in the background. I mean, I could close that out, but I still wanna watch it to make sure it's done. So it's importing and it's doing it at the same time on both of these. I do wonder which one of these machines is going to finish this process first because Android Studio and Android emulators have been the bane of my existence when it comes to working on MacBook Airs. They work as long as you don't do too much stuff on your computer. All right, it's not done yet. It's indexing. That's what I'm talking about. Look at this. It's still doing it. Setting up run configurations. But you know what? It's actually kind of keeping up. Oh, this one's done. All right, so this one was finished a couple of seconds earlier. It's fine. Let's run this app, Gradle build running. We are starting up the emulator and this one started just a tad bit faster. That was my previous app that I was running in this emulator. So it remembered it. it's gonna start up a new, new instance. Yeah, yeah, this one's just a tad bit ahead. Always a little bit ahead, but you know, this one's keeping up quite nicely. Hello, Android, there we go. Let's see what it's like using the emulator itself. I'm gonna pop open YouTube here. It's actually not bad, interesting. Yeah, it's working quite well. While that's happening, let's take a look at our memory pressure. Hey, this is not bad. Android Studio has gotten a lot better with uh, memory management. Let's start up Docker here. I'm gonna kick off this command. Docker compose up, build, force, recreate. Now this will have to go and grab a few images first just to kind of refresh them. So I won't count this particular step, but what that command will do is basically blow away all the containers and recreate them each time and rebuild them. We'll ignore this first run, but I I wanted to show you this app. It's a pretty neat example voting app, it's called. You can find it on uh, GitHub under Docker samples. And this app's architecture has, what is that, five containers, a Python front end, Node front end, a .NET worker, Redis cache, and a Postgres database all working together at the same time. So when you do Docker compose up, it spins all of them up at the same time. And to keep things realistic, I will have a few things working in the background. I will have oh, about 15 Chrome tabs working. I have two Doist, I have Notion, those are my some of the tools that I constantly have open. I have the terminal open, VS Code, Activity Monitor, and of course, Docker. And let's go. Let's do this one more time. Now, for those of you that are curious about that run, that was 23 seconds here on the 16 gigabyte machine, 25 seconds, 32 gigabyte machine. But I did say ignore that, right? Because we're gonna blow that away anyway. That was a network dependent request. So let's do that again and see what happens this time around. It's gonna stop all the containers, then it's gonna rebuild them, recreate them and run them. Okay, so that was seven seconds over here and seven seconds over here. No biggie. If you're doing development with Docker and you need to run five containers, hey, this is not bad at all. Unless, of course, your containers are gonna have a lot more memory requirements. These don't. So it's gonna be very dependent on what you're doing with your Docker installation. But if you try this example voting app, which is open source, you can see how it runs on your current machine and compare it. One other thing we can do is we can scale. So. I can add the command scale the worker container and I can give it uh, the number of workers I wanted to use. So let's scale that to 10. This time it's going to spin up 10 worker containers along with the other containers. So you can see that right there. It's recreating them. It's going to take a little bit longer. So <laughs> not that much longer. 7.6 seconds on the 16 gigabyte machine, 7.5 seconds on the 32 gigabyte machine. But now we should have a little bit more memory usage going on here. And yeah, we do. We're pushing very close to that limit here and memory used. Let's let's give it a few more instances. So I'm gonna push this up to 100, 100 worker examples. I don't know if you know if this is gonna start up really, because that's a lot. And it's also kind of a contrived example just to push the system. Who's gonna be running 100 workers on their MacBook Air while they're developing locally? Maybe you will, I don't know, but most likely you won't. Most likely you'll push this out to another machine to do. Oh. Okay, well, we did see differences in two runs. They're not significant though. 19 seconds on the 32 gigabyte machine, over 20 seconds on the 16 gigabyte machine. And we are using just a little bit more memory here. So not a biggie. But the point is that the 16 gigabyte machine is still quite usable and responsive. Never at any point in time did I have this machine not responsive. It's always been responsive. It's always very usable. The code is very easy to navigate. Is it a few 
few seconds slower here and there? Sure. Did we run into cases where there were slowdowns because of high memory pressure? Yes, yes we did. But also we did on the 32 gigabyte machine. So 32 gigabyte machine is gonna give you a lot more breathing room. You'll be able to run a lot more things on it. And I think it deserves the name MacBook Pro Mini, don't you? In fact, if you wanna see how that machine does against the M4 MacBook Pro, then watch this video right over here. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.